Hello everybody, this is Zaxter99. Welcome back to Chapter 2 of The Hero of Kendrickstone. Now, if you remember back to Chapter 1, I basically uh, made some choices to decide that I was a wizard. I decided to be an ice wizard. I could choose between a warrior, a wizard, a thief, and I believe a bard. And I shot a magical spell at some big dragon. That's kind of where I started in a big dragon's den, and my mission was to kill this big mighty fire or blood dragon. And then the dragon was talking to me, and at the end of the chapter, uh, I had defeated him, but he was basically saying, wake up, wake up, in a deep, you know, I guess, dragon voice. So, you know, I'm kind of thinking now, well, maybe somebody's telling me to wake up, and I was streaming this battle with a dragon. But we're going to find out what happens right here in chapter two. Now, the one thing that I'm seeing with this story right now, if you go up to the options, there's stats and you know, reset and achievements and stuff like that, and the menu doesn't give you an option to save your progress. I read on the forums, people are saying if you just close it, that it should save uh, your spot for you for the next time you open it up. But I'm not taking that chance. I'm just leaving it minimized down in my taskbar until I read each chapter. So, uh, you know, it'd be nice if they actually had a save option before you close it, and at least make you feel more comfortable. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and jump back into chapter two in this video. So that's coming up right after this. Chapter 2, The Road to Kendrickstone. Wake up! Your eyes flutter open to the bright light of the morning sun, streaming through the window. The light seems to wash over you, a radiant tide burning your eyes. As seconds pass, the light recedes, and you see the dark, blurry outlines of shapes and figures. The world around you solidifies into a concrete image. You wipe the last vestiges sleep from your eyes and regain your bearings. Looking around, you see the small castle chamber where you lived and slept as a squire, a steer in room paid for by your nightly performances, or the village sanctuary where you sheltered last night from, the magic, from a magic-fearing mob, or the shepherd's hut where you were born and raised, where your parents died. Hmm... You know, I like the intrigue of the shepherd's hut where I was born and raised and where my parents died, so let's choose that. You haul yourself out of bed slowly, crawling to the edge of the wide, straw-filled mattress. Someone called you awake. Was it your... No, it couldn't have been. Your bed was made for three people, and once three people had filled it. Now your parents are dead, carried away by the sweating fever that swept through the, fil the little village of Forester's Hollow last winter. The few pieces of solid wooden furniture that once filled your parents', parents cottage are gone too. Only the bed remains. You sold it all when you finally made your decision just a few days after the last of the winter snow melted. You take a few moments to pack up the last of your belongings, chief among them a stout quarterstaff, a crude looking but well made sling, and a bag of lead sling bullets. There is also a small heavy pouch filled with silver pennies, 75 of them at last count. Your furniture, your extra clothes, even the sheep in your flock that survived the winter were all sold off and returned for the contents of that small leather sack. You've no need for furniture or sheep where you're going. Today, you become an adventurer. You pick up your pack and look around the empty one-room house where you were born. Happy memories of your childhood flash through your mind. Your mother teaching you how to fight off wolves with a sling. Your father showing you how to read the signs of the forest and meadow. Then comes the memory that lies over the room like an oppressive pall. Your parents laying side by side, both covered in a sheen of sweat as they breathe their last. On the day your parents were taken from the house and burned, you realize that the house you grew up in would never be yours. It would always be your parents' house. It had been built with their sweat and blood and lives of hard work. You will have to find your own way and make your own life. Even before your parents died, you were a daydreamer. 
Long hours spent watching sheep graze allowed you to indulge your imagination. Even on those idyllic summer days, you imagined you were someone to be reckoned with, wielding power and wealth, or someone to look up to, paragon of justice and mercy, or someone on their own path, free of strictures of village life, or someone for tyrants to fear, an enemy of evil things. Hmm. I'm going to be, again, a good guy. I'm going to say I'm a t uh, someone for tyrants of fear, an enemy of evil things. Your parents did the best to teach you the meaning of good and evil, of compassion and order. Perhaps they succeeded too well. After a while, you began to see petty injustices that infested the village you lived in. The apothecary who gouged his sick customers, the merchant who cheated her customers, the corrupt bailiff, willing to arrest innocents and only let them go for a bribe. You see that the sight of them, knowing that each little innocent crime hurts someone. Even so, you knew greater justices waited outside the world of your village, and you longed for the power to correct them. You push open through the wooden boards of the front door one last time. Taking a deep breath, you step out into the morning sun. You walk down the off-trodden path of the pitted and rough country road. You head for the small stone bridge that leads across the river and out of the village. Despite having lived in Forester's Hollow all your life, you know where you are bound. You've heard it on the lips of your parents, of others in the village, and of passing traitors. Kendrickstone. Kendrickstone is a walled city of 15,000, one of the greatest settlements in the Cordoc. It is the seat of Duke who rules over your village and many others. It is a place where your daydreams might come true. You sling your pack against your back as you walk down the dirt road and take your first steps as an adventurer. So I'm guessing that's the end of chapter two? No. Okay. Soon you find yourself walking east down the wide eastern road to Kendrickstone. Even as the crisp, cool air of the early morning gives way to the heat of the noonday sun, the trees of the forest each side of the road shade you from the warmth of the day. Thankfully, the last few days have been similarly clear and dry, which means the road is firm under your feet. You know well enough that a single heavy rainfall can be enough to reduce a dirt road to a knee-deep mass of mud and slime. Such a quagmire would make traveling any substantial distance nearly impossible. Today, however, with the roads as solid as rock under your feet, you make good progress, pausing every few hours to rest your legs. For nearly the entire day, you walk on in solitude, sounds of the forest and the occasional flitting bird, your only companion. Therefore, it is almost a surprise when you hear the clip-chop of iron-shod horses and the rattle of wheels rising from the road ahead. Soon, the source of the sound comes into view. A handful of riders leading four heavy covered ox pulled wagons, a merchant caravan. You get a better look as so the distance between you and the caravan slowly closes. The outriders are clearly ready for danger, clad in vests of boiled leather, swords and maces belted to their hips. A few others sit in the wagons, children mostly wearing sturdy, well made traveling garb. At the head of the caravan are a man and a woman, both mounted. You size them up as they approach. The woman is a hard-faced and dangerous-looking, armed and armored in the same fashion as the outriders, with a wide-brimmed kettle helm over her head besides. The man is plump and red, a brush of bright red hair adorning his fleshy face. Hail, friend, the male shouts as you close to within 30 paces of each other. How will you respond? I'll return the man's friendly greeting, of course. I wave back, but keep my distance. I keep my head down and keep walking. Hmm. I am going to uh, wave back, but keep my distance. How about that? You return the caravan master's friendly gesture, but you neither return his shouted greeting nor approach the group of riders and ox carts. The woman riding beside the caravan master glares at you as she rides by, her hand resting plainly on the hilt of her sword at her belt. 
Not very friendly, that one, you hear the plump merchant say as he rides on behind you. I don't blame him, the woman replies, her voice fading into the ambient noises of the moving caravan. There are bandits about in these woods. Who knows what tricks they might be up to. The voices recede into the distance as you walk on. The caravan continues on its ponderous, rattling way as well. Within minutes, it is nothing more than a cloud of dust. The sound of the iron-shod hooves fades behind you. Okay. Before you've gotten much further, the sun reaches the horizon and the sky begins to grow dark. This late in the day, mosquitoes come out in force, buzzing around you in thick black clouds, even as darkness turns the verdant forest of each side of you into ominous tangles of shadow. You know better than to think that the dark woods are empty, though. Wolves come out to hunt at night, and such creatures have no qualms about attacking lone travelers if they're, in, if they're hungry enough. The sight of a large building up ahead, with brightly lit windows and smoke coming out of its chimneys, is welcome indeed. As you get closer and the sun finally dips under the horizon, you see that the structure is a large two-story hall accompanied by a row of stables and surrounded by a head-high stone fence. Sounds of music and laughter spill out of the open windows, and a bright watch fire burns at the fence's gate, next to a cruelly painted wooden sign of an angry-looking figure hung from an iron post set into the gate post. The Growling Giant Inn, the, science, the sign says, in bright red letters visible by the light of the watch fire. You make your way past the fence, through the courtyard, and into the main hall. The high ceiling common room of the Growling Giant Inn is a bright and filled with stink of urine, spilt ale, roasting meat, and burning wood. All the aromas of human civilization. Maybe half the benches in the big room are empty. The rest are filled with merchants, caravan guards, and other travelers, each busy with their own amusements, whether drink, food, dice, or song. You walk up to the bar. Behind it sits the tall, burly innkeeper, idly polishing a bottle of some dark fluid you've never seen before. You ask him for a bed for the night. In response, the innkeeper rattles off a long list of options and their associated costs, from the expensive and luxurious to the downright squalid but cheap. How will you choose to spend the night? Lavishly. I take the biggest room and order the finest food and drink, 15 silvers, comfortably, Get a small private room, some hearty fare, eight silvers. Modestly, a bed in a common room and some hot food will do. Cheaply, some dry bread and a pile of hay in the stables is enough for me. I go modestly, I guess. I probably should go cheaply, but it's definitely not either one of these, especially if I'm down to my last 75 silver coins. I'm going to go modestly and think that's going a little high. Supper you eat that night isn't the worst you've ever had, but it could certainly be better. Still, a bowl of honeyed porridge, a crust of black bread, and a tankard of almost sour ale fills your stomach quite well enough. That night, you are shown to a straw-stuffed mattress on the wooden floor of one of the common bedrooms. There, you are aside your belongings and lie down among a dozen other sleeping men and women. Despite the accumulated fatigue of the day's travel, still takes you some time to fall asleep, kept awake as you are by the loud snores of someone. It's too dark to know who, at the other end of the room. You suppose this is something you'll have to get used to as an adventurer. Finally, you are simply too fatigued to stay awake. Uh oh, I guess I should have splurged more, huh? Anyway, finally you are simply too fatigued to stay awake. You close your eyes and do not open them again until the next morning. Despite your initial difficulties getting to bed, you find that your sleep has returned some of your energy. After a small breakfast of black bread, cheese, and more ale, you set off down the road to Kendrickstone once again. By noon, you can tell you are getting close to the city. In the distance, through gaps in the trees, you catch the sight of smoke from a thousand chimneys. You pick up the pace, knowing that there are unlikely to be any more inns on the way of the great city. Finally, halfway through the afternoon, you see in the distance the tower of bright red stone, one of the spires of Kendrickstone's keep. You squint your eyes and lean forward for a closer look, 
which is why you don't realize you aren't alone in the forest until an arrow buries itself in the dirt of the road, just a pace in front of you. Ooh. The foliage of the sides of the road rustles, and out step a half a dozen men and women. Each is armed, each looks at you threateningly, and each is clad entirely in black. You doubt they are here to exchange pleasantries. One of the black cat clad men carries an ash bow in one hand. No doubt, he was the one who shot at you. He steps forward, expression malevolent. One lone child wandering down the road when these bandits about? <laughs> foolish, very foolish. Your muscles clench, your eyes widen, and you feel a bead of cold sweat trickle down your back. The black clad archer, clearly the leader, pulls another arrow from his quiver and knocks it to his bowstring. Hand over your coin of weapons, boy, slowly. No sudden movements, or this next arrow goes through your heart. Ooh, what will you do? I will fight them, of course. And there is six of them, is that right? I think it said half a dozen. Let's see here. Yep, half a dozen men and women. I try to run and lose them in the forest. I shield, and that sounds like something a thief would do. I shield myself with my magic, or maybe I could stall them with words while I think of a plan. I think I'm going to sh oh, I can't shield myself with my magic, I wonder why not. It's not an option. Only these three are options. The, the one that's uh, blocked out I was going to think I was going to use. I guess I'm going to fight them. Alright, let's see what happens. You reach for your belt to draw your weapon, but you're too slow. I thought I was a mage, and the bandit with a bow is too fast. Your hands are barely halfway to your waist when he loses his arrow. All thoughts of turning and fighting leave your mind as you throw yourself to the side. Your arm explodes in pain as something cold and sharp digs deep into it. Is this what being hit by an arrow feels like? You have no desire to repeat the experience. You scramble to the side of the road into the underbrush. Frantically, you look for cover as the bandit pulls another arrow from his quiver. Your eyes latch onto a large, stout-looking tree. Quickly, you run to it, just quickly enough for its wooden bulk to protect you from your black-clad assailant's arrow. This almost sounds like I'm on the path of the thief now or something. You look down at your arm to see a feathered wooden shaft buried in your flesh. After a moment of panic, you breathe deeply, close your eyes, and pull it out. The pain is excruciating. It's all you can do to keep from screaming. And when the pain finally subsides enough for you to think clearly, you hear the sound of footsteps on the other side of the tree. The other bandits are making their way forward, trying to flush you out. You ready your weapon and emerge from your cover to confront your attackers, only to find yourself face to face with a black clad archer. Barely ten paces from you, he has an arrow knocked, drawn, and aimed at your heart. You should have just given us your money, boy, he snarls. Stop right there, criminal scum. The black cloud archer turns towards the sound of the new voice almost by instinct. He loses his arrow only to see it bury itself in the painted oak of a stout shield not ten paces away. The shield's bearer is a tall, muscular figure, covered in a full suit of steel mail and heavy great helm, glittering in the afternoon sun. The newcomer carries the sword and shield of a noble-born soldier, and wears the surcoat of a knight. Impossible! The archer's growling, snarling voice suddenly jumps in octave. I shot you! I shot you! Right in the metal stone heart! I killed you! The knight laughs, a low husky contrello echoing within her closed helm. Oh, it's a woman. You tried to kill me, you stupid prat! The bandit scrambles backwards, hands shaking with panic as he tries to draw another arrow. The knight advances slowly, deliberately. The archer loses his shaft, only for it to once again embed itself in the armored woman's shield. The bandits rush the knight, and one of them lunges, a dagger held high. The mail-clad warrior barely breaks her stride. The subtle shift of her footing sends the charger bandit staggering past and she knocks him down with a contemptuous flick of her shield. 
Behind the hapless attacker, the others stop in their tracks. The knight's prowess has given them enough pause for her to advance on the bandit leader, who has dropped his bow and now holds his dagger before him like a talisman. The bandit, who seemed so frightening just a moment before, had been reduced to a whimpering child. If you found me in a happier mood, I'd advise you to try to kill me harder next time, the knight jest, the dryness of her voice thick enough to be evident through her helm. Today, however, I'm going to make sure you won't try to kill anyone ever again. The knight slams her shield into the bandit leader as if it were a giant oaken fist. The dagger drops from the archer's fingers, and the knight brings her blade down onto the bandit's head, cleaving skin, bone, and brain. A quick death. Ooh. With a fluid kick, the armored warrior sends the archer's bodily tumbling, tumbling to the ground. By the time it hits the forest floor, nobody else is in sight. Nobody living, anyhow. Wow. Who is this mighty female warrior? She's my hero, that's for sure. With the bandits gone, the knight wipes her bloody sword on her surcoat and rushes toward you, still holding her shield up. Don't move, stay where you are, she shouts, as she sheathes her sword and lowers her shield. She then tears a strip of relatively clean cloth from her surcoat. She hands you the strip of cloth. Can you bind your own wounds, boy? You take the offered material and bandage your wound the best you can. That shall do for now, the knight replies, but I would very much suggest you get your wounds washed and rebound by an actual healer as soon as you can. The knight helps you up with one muscular hand. She takes her heavy steel helm and padded coif with her other to reveal a strong featured face barely touched by age, but heavily ravaged by the scars of battle. She offers you a polite bow as you find your feet, her short-cut mouse-brown hair dangling in swear-matted tangles around her head as she does. I have the donor to be Dame Mildred of Sonamershi, the knight of Kendrickstone, she says, with a formality that seems to sit uncomfortably with her. Who might you be? Alexander, from Forest Hollow, you reply. The knight nods. Well met then, Alexander and my apologies for not arriving sooner. But you nod, though you can hardly see the knight's arrival could have been any luckier. It would be best if you put some distance between us and the scene. Those bandits might return in greater numbers. You take a look at the short stretch of road and the corpse of the man who almost killed you, lying unmoving in a pool of his own blood and brains. Getting away seems like a really good idea. Wow pretty good. After about 200 paces, you come to a tall, sleek warhorse, saddled, caparisoned, and tied up to a tree on the side of the road. Dame Mildred gives the horse an affectionate pat and begins untying him. I suppose, she says, looking over at you, you were bound for Kendrickstone, eh? You nod. Might I know why? The knight pulls the rope free and begins coiling it up. Hmm, I am headed for Kendrickstone because I am seeking a worthy master to take service with. I'm looking for some I'm looking to become an adventurer for hire. I want to find my own way in the big city. Or that's none of your business. Hmm. I'm gonna say the first one. Seek a worthy master to take service with. Mildred barks out a laugh. A hey, master. Well, you're in great luck, boy. Mildred continues as she ties the rope onto the saddlebag. I happen to be in need of a new servant in arms for my retinue. It's hard work, but it's a meal, a bed, and time off if you need it. You think it over. Steady meals and a warm bed do sound good, but tying yourself to a mistress, no matter how generous, might prove restrictive. So, the knight demands as she checks over her saddle harness. What say you? Definitely interested. I'll need to think about it. I have to decline. I'm going to say I'll need to think about it. I get No, I'm just going to go ahead and decline her. Let's try that. The knight frowns but nods. I see. Well, if you change your mind, go to the keep in Kendrickstone City and ask for me. I'll have you enrolled in my retinue. Finally, Dame Mildred finishes her preparations. She places a foot in the stirrup and with a single fluid motion swings herself into the saddle. She brings her horse about 
back towards the distant blood-red spires of Kendrickstone. She looks down at you from the saddle. If you'd like, I could escort you to the city gates. It won't be much trouble for me. Part of my duty is to keep travelers, tra keep travelers safe, after all. Yeah, I like that. I mean, it's been a pretty dangerous trip so far, so why not? The two of you set towards the distant gates of Kendrickstone. Dame Mildred mounted on her horse and you on foot. The first few moments pass in silence as you mull over the events of the day. Soon, however, the silence starts to seem oppressive. You look over at your escort as she rides beside you, reins in one hand, great helm carried under her arm in the other. She seems unlikely to strike up another conversation, but perhaps you have some questions for her. Talk to Dame Mildred or stay silent and keep to yourself. Let's talk to her. Why not? Pardon me, my lady. Can I ask you some questions? The knight looks down at you. It's only then you notice she seems as bored as you. Go ahead. Ask away. Where are you from, anyways, I ask? What's it like being a knight of Kendrickstone? Are the roads usually this unsafe? Did that bandit back there really shoot you through the heart like he claimed? Or I've no more questions. I'm going to ask, did that bandit really shoot you through the heart like he claimed? It seems like a stupid question, really. Indeed, for a second, Dame Mildred looks at you as you were so, if you were some kind of idiot. Seeing as I'm still up and breathing, I'm pretty sure he didn't. She looks down for a moment. Admittedly, he did aim an arrow for my heart when he ambushed me, and it did fly true. All right, now you're curious. If the arrow hit you, how did you survive? The mounted knight simply extends her arm towards you as she shakes it, letting the fine steel links of her male hauberk rattle and catch the afternoon sun. Armor, boy, if you plan on facing more danger in the future, I'd suggest you getting yourself some. It may be expensive, but I'll... It'll keep all your blood and guts where they should be, especially seeing. She looks pointedly at your bandages, as how you appear to have trouble with that a bit. Hmm, wow. She kind of insulted me there, I think. All right, so where are you from, anyways? What's it like being a knight of Kendrickstone? Are the roads usually this unsafe? Well, I guess I'll say that. Dame Mildred shakes her head. With all the armor she's wearing, even that simple movement sounds like a collapsing pot shop. Normally, the roads are much safer than this. Road patrol is usually a job we give our squires and get them used to a rough living this year around. Knight looks down at you, her expression teemed with worry. We've had more bandit attacks in the past season than the year before. All the survivors say the same thing. Brigands in black who take no prisoners. That's why we've got full knights like me riding the roads. Okay, I'm going to say, uh, I'll get no more questions. No, I'm going to say, where are you from? Me? Your knightly companion seems caught off guard by the question. I was born in Salmon of Mercy. My mother is Baroness there. Can't say you're surprised by her rank. Most knights are noble birth, after all. However, despite your life in Forester's Hollow, you must confess to the knight that you've never heard of, Son of Mercy. It's a fortress that guards the marches between the Duchy of Kendrickstone and the Curlandis to the south, Mildred explains. It's maybe a day's ride south from the city. I was raised and become a page there, before I was sent to Kendrickstone to squire for one of the Duke's knights. The knight leans back in her saddle, her expression wistful. I won my spurs at a tourney in Torrenhall. I spent a few years riding around in the Corndot as a knight errant. When I came back to the city, I took service as one of the Duke's knights, and I've been ever since. What's it like? I have no more questions. The knight merely nods in reply. The two of you continue on your way. You and Dame Mildred continue your journey to the city gates in silence as the afternoon turns into evening. The sun is low in the sky when the two of you finally leave the forest and find yourself a few hundred paces from the imposing gates of the city of Kendrickstone. Your journey is over for now. All right, so that was chapter two. I am going to go ahead and continue this story in my next video. I'm not much of a reader, so some of these words I'm probably pronouncing wrong. Uh, I think I get the gist of what they're saying, but, you know, uh, please excuse me because I've read maybe 15, 20 books in my life. So 
Uh, I do find this one pretty interesting. Again, I'm not much of a reader, so I don't really know how good it is. It looks like it's a pretty good story to me. It looks like it's pretty well written. Let me down in the comments below if you guys are enjoying this story and if you want to hear more. Also, if you'd like to play this game yourself and make your own choices, be sure you click the link below. Go buy the game on Steam, uh, and it looks like it's a, uh, you know, it looks like it's a pretty wor worthwhile affair. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Be sure you let me know if you guys want to see more. The best way you can do that is to give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. Thanks for watching, everybody. This has been Zaxter99 with the uh, Choose Your Own Adventure game. Uh, no pictures. It's all your imagination. The hero of Kendrickstone. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. This has been Zaxter99.